Although Easy Chair were a far more conventional blues rock outfit than any of the acts on the Bizarre label, Zappa was nevertheless impressed by the band and their compositions when they played at the bottom of the bill for the mothers in Seattle. And for Easy Chair, it was only a stroke of luck that led Zappa to attend their performance in the first place. Because he was asked to stay over with his band in the audience because they, they sound checked so late, they were forced to listen to the first band. Moi. So we went out there and uh, opened with this piece that we put together that was, you know, like philosophical rock, post-ironic, mumbo-jumbo instrumental, and a couple other perfunctory rock uh, tunes and went to our room. And Frank came in there afterwards and said, who wrote the songs? And I said, man, we all did, you know, trying to be communist. And uh, he says, well, I have this label and I've got this group, Alice Cooper, and and if you guys come to Los Angeles, we'll try and work something up maybe for you. And, and then when he walked out of the room, we all looked at each other and went, that's the guy. Zappa now had five acts on his roster, all in various stages of development. While Easy Chair made their way down to the Tropicana Motel in LA, where they would take up residence and begin penning their proposed debut album, in the Magic Band's Woodland Hills house, Beefheart was beginning to formulate a new direction for his act. Energized by Zappa's promise of total artistic freedom, he decided to take the band's music even further from conventional rock than the material on Strictly Personal. And the band's regular trips to the log cabin in Laurel Canyon were feeding him ideas. We had gone up there one day to visit. I remember Frank coming downstairs in the log cabin, shaking everybody's hands, very businesslike, you know, hello, hello. And, uh, but it was, it was pretty casual, nice time, and I really enjoyed it because Frank I, I was really stunned that Frank was so open and approachable, uh, whereas Don was you know, always seemed to be hiding behind some kind of a curtain. He wasn't, you know, he was like the Wizard of Oz kind of character, you know. He was one person publicly and another person privately, where Zappa seemed, you know, more as a what you see is what you get kind of guy. Well, as we left, Ian was showing up. He says, okay, I gotta go to work, so you guys gotta leave. Ian Underwood showed up and sat down at the piano and Frank had some music written out and Ian started playing it for him. And I noticed that Don decided to pay close attention to this for a minute. And I, and I saw him watching this process that was going on. And they came to the house and the next thing I know, he's saying, I want to get a piano. <laughs> Beefheart was musically untrained and although he was a notable harmonica player, that was the only instrument he'd mastered. Yet after Safe as Milk, he had been the group's sole songwriter. Previously, when composing tracks, he'd whistled, sung, or verbally explained his ideas, and the band members had worked these into musical parts. Through the piano, he would now take greater authorial control, and initially, the band members had to be on standby with a tape recorder to capture his impulsive flashes of creativity. Don was like a guy with, he would have these inspirations, and then they were gone, and it was a sense of total urgency and you better be totally committed to catching it while it was there with him. So I finally told him one day the tape recorder was broken. I took the fuse out of it and just told him it was broken. And um, I had been writing music, uh, just drum, drum ideas. I had been writing things down, transcribing them in musical notation. And so I noticed him playing one day and I just wrote down something that he played and he thought, uh, afterwards, I left it sitting, and I, I wasn't even thinking in terms of doing that. It just seemed like, I wonder if I can actually write down the notes he's playing. And I, and I wrote this thing down, and he came down later and said, can you play this? Is this what I, uh, what I was playing? And I said, well, it was one thing you were playing, you know, it takes a while to do that. And he said, can you play it back? And I said, I think so, and I went and played it, and he says, man, that's what we're going to do. Drummer French became Beefheart's interpreter, the conduit between his bursts of inspiration and the band members themselves. French notated and then pieced together dozens of small sections and then passed them on to the guitarists Bill Harkleroad and Jeff Cotton and new bassist Mark Boston to learn. It was an unprecedented compositional process, the structuring of apparent chaos. The thing about the piano, now I really like the idea of it. Then I think because the material was so difficult to play, um, I thought it was really interesting and it was so stretching on me harmonically to move from even a Coltrane type of sound to 
many keys, time signatures, and just the the frozen memorization of those parts. You know, um, John's dedication to it and worked very hard was very obvious, and that was pretty inspiring. Um, I spent more time with Jeff Cotton working on guitar parts, you know, and doing that. But um, the piano thing, I think I might have been really bummed out in the beginning because of the first tunes were slide type tunes, had that bluesier element, Sugar and Spikes, Moon of the Month. And then all of a sudden we're doing Neon Meat Dream of an Octafish, and it's, that's a transition. <laughs> and so the piano thing, I think at first was, I got to learn that, you know, and then in the process, and then as soon as we rehearsed a few of the tunes and they kind of gelled, it made sense to me. This process was draining and would last nine long months as the band members navigated uncharted territory. Yet although the compositional processes taking place at the Magic Band's house were unique to rock, Beefheart did have his influences from the world of avant-garde music. Artists such as Ornette Coleman and Karl-Heinz Stockhausen and the new wave of American tape composers and minimalists such as Pauline Oliveros and Steve Reich were inspirations. And their work was on constant rotation in the house with Beefheart trying to rid his young musicians of their blues and rock tendencies. The GTO's Miss Pamela was a sometime visitor to the house, having befriended Van Vliet years before, and she was witness to the eccentric playlist. I hung out there quite a bit and smoked a lot of pot with them. I remember one night in particular, they, they had this song that they loved to play over and over again called Come Out and Show Them. They would play that over and over and over on a loop. And when you're smoking a lot of pot, I'm telling you, that, that just becomes very psychedelic. And I remember trying, standing there in a circle with Don and John and Zuthorn Rollo and Victor <laughs> in this circle. And I remember trying to get my eyeballs to roll in one direction and then stop them in mid thing and roll them in the other, and I could not control them. That was really scary. I had already been listening to things very close to that. Not Albert Eiler, not Pauline Oliveris, you know. Uh, that was where things that I hadn't heard. But I think Don had been listening to those things longer than just that period. He, he was too versed on it, you know, right from the get-go to, to just think that he, you know, in a month started listening to these things and just, because he could call off tunes, you know, from, from way back. So I think, I think maybe him and Frank, I don't know about that, um, were listening to some fairly avant-garde stuff way before I showed up. Despite the extreme creativity occurring within the house, significant problems were developing. Cut off from the outside world, Beefheart had begun to mistreat his young band members, who both admired and feared him. Although he may have been an artistic visionary, he was also irrational, tyrannical and manipulative. They were all 19, 20 years old. First of all, Don Van Vliet was many years older than them, and evidently he was an aggressive sort of person and personality. They were not eating, they were smoking tons of cigarettes, they weren't getting any exercise, they all wound up sleeping in the den there with the instruments not taking baths, they'd get up and start rehearsing again. Don would also, whenever he felt like it, he would sit there and talk to the band, almost like a brainwashing session, for hours on end. It could be two hours, two days. So these guys, by the end of it all, were just completely, for lack of a better term, they were completely, their, their spirits and their wills and everything about them was broken down so where they were only functioning as his, you know, for what he wanted them to do and that was it. It was a slow encroachment. It's sort of like there's a faucet dripping and suddenly you're floating on the ceiling with this much air left. That's kind of the way it happened. It was very slow and it was like a gradual process. Don was a master manipulator. I've never seen anybody manipulate people like he did. He was a very, very powerful person at the time. I never saw anybody stand up to Don. I think Don basically was trying to break down our wills and also at the same time turn us against each other so that we had sort of walls between us. We wouldn't communicate, we wouldn't confer with each other, even though we were in the same room. When he was out of the room, we wouldn't talk because we knew that guy would say something. You know, we'd rat each other out. And when it got to the point to where that started happening, like, you know, Don would get us alone and he would, for instance, this is the way it starts, 
Don would get us alone and he'd say, well, what do you think of him doing that? And I'd say, well, it could be this or that. And well, he'd repeat that in the group talk. And he'd say, well, you know what he thinks? He thinks that blah, 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 you know. Well, this is something that I said in confidence, but now suddenly it's being said to the person out of context and they're hearing it as though I'm ratting on them. And that happened with everybody uh, to the point to where we sort of had walls up between us. It was, it was a very strange situation. Uh, I've never seen anybody who, who was able to control people like that. The process of what Don was doing was uh, frightening, painful, confusing, and all of the things that you feel at 19 where there was this other fear inside of me of dying in Vietnam. And so it was, I was so ripe coming from an LSD cult before that to have daddy do, do me in, <laughs> you know? So I was giving up, I was giving it up. I was just, this was like, I had been dropped into the perfect band. I mean, Frank's band and the Beef Art Band were my two favorite bands by far. For me to end up there, I felt safe but then it was like the battered wife syndrome or the, you know, the total abusive situation. So there was tremendous confusion and I was not ready to really admit how much abuse was really happening or I wouldn't have stayed that long. Zappa was apparently unaware of the development of what he himself would later call a cult-like situation. While the Magic Band were deteriorating in late 1968, the mothers had just got back to LA from a successful European tour and upon their return, he assessed his various acts. The GTOs had managed to pen a number of songs, just as he had requested, and both Wildman Fisher and Alice Cooper were ready for the studio. He therefore decided to properly introduce these bands and bizarre records to the public as one homogenous collective, and in early December booked a show at the Shrine Exposition Hall. With the mothers headlining, Easy Chair, the GTOs, Alice Cooper and Wildman Fisher all performed at the historic event. It would be the first and last time that these label mates played on the same bill. We had written the material for the album and Frank came home and asked us to perform with the Mothers and Alice Cooper. We were beside ourselves. I mean, it was such a thrill, really nervous though. I mean, we were just girls and we didn't know what we were doing, but he did get us a rehearsal hall, Lindy Opera House in Hollywood, where a lot of other bands were rehearsing. We saw some cool people there, but we rehearsed like crazy. We really got it down as far as down as anybody, you know, could get it, how nutty it was. But we had prop, lots of props. And I sang a song called The Ooh Ooh Man, which is on the album. And I sang to a big fake snowman. And it was about Nick St. Nicholas, my crush at the moment. And he was there in the audience. And I remember just being so embarrassed and wondering what he would think and all that. I thought it went really well. I wish somebody had filmed it. Even more so than the Whiskey A Go Go gig opening for the Mothers, or even uh, Led Zeppelin, the uh, Shrine Exposition Hall was a, uh, a definite uh, boost to us because here we were playing for a whole room full of freaks, and on the same bill with a lot of our uh, uh, idols. The GTOs were there supporting us. They were also in the show. We were supporting them. Everybody was, it, there was a lot of camaraderie, as opposed to a lot of festivals back then where, you know, this band does this and this band does that, and you liked them, but there wasn't that same, we're all from the same planet kind of a thing. Yet one act in particular was conspicuously absent from the Shrine Exposition show. We did not feel part of a community. We were our own community. We were in our little huddled up cave, and that was very much orchestrated by Don Valley. What I heard, again, was, well, we're geniuses, and, or at least I am, Don, um, and those people are, are you kidding me? We're not going on stage with them.